wisp is red. A S M R. Hello, this is Emma. I'm now going to read to you by candlelight. I picked a few books from my collection, just randomly, and I'm going to, again, randomly flick through them and just read an excerpt or two from some of the books, okay? There aren't any sections. So this video is for you to concentrate on the candle and just hear my voice. Rest or sleep. Here is your candle. It's a brand new one just for you. It's for Bina. Just a delicate scent. Strong, nice and soft. First book is The Road Less Travelled. Psychology of love, traditional values and spiritual growth.
all the misconceptions about love, the most powerful and pervasive is to believe that falling in love is love, or at least one of the manifestations of love. It is a potent misconception because falling in love is subjectively experienced in a very powerful fashion and as an experience of love. To understand the nature of the phenomenon of falling in love and the inevitability of its ending, it is necessary to examine the nature of what psychiatrists call ego boundaries. From what we can ascertain by indirect evidence, it appears that the newborn infant during the first few months of its life does not distinguish between itself and the rest of the universe. When it moves its arms and legs, the world is moving. When it is hungry, the world is hungry. When it sees its mother move, it is as if it is moving. When its mother sings, the baby does not know that it is itself not making the sound. It cannot distinguish itself from the crib, the room or its parents. The animate and the inanimate are the same, there is no distinction. It and the world are one. There are no boundaries, no separations, there is no identity. But with the experience the child begins to experience itself, namely as the entity separate from the rest of the world. When it is hungry, mother doesn't always appear to feed it. When it is playful, Mother doesn't always want to play. The child then has the experience of its wishes not being in mother's command. Love is not a feeling. I have said that love is an action, an activity, that leads to the final major misconception of love, which needs to be addressed. Love is not a feeling. Many, many people possessing a feeling of love, and even acting in response to that feeling, act in all manner of unloving and destructive ways. On the other hand, a genuinely loving individual will often take loving and constructive action towards a person he or she consciously dislikes. Actually feeling no love toward the person at the time and perhaps even finding the person repugnant in some way. The feeling of love is the emotion that accompanies the experience Cathecting. Cathecting, it will be remembered, is the process by which an object becomes important to us. Once cathected, the object, commonly referred to as the love object, is invested with our energy as if it were a part of ourselves, and the relationship between us and the invested object is called cathesis. Since we may have many such relationships going on at the same time, we speak of our cathesis, the process of withdrawing our energy from a love object so that it loses its sense of importance for us, is known as de the misconception that love is a feeling, a 
exists because we confuse connecting with loving. Chapter 15 The Cauliflower Robbery Master, a gift for you. These six huge cauliflowers were planted with my hands. I have watched over their growth with the tender care of a mother nursing her child. I presented the basket of vegetables with a ceremonial flourish. Thank you said with a smile, and it was warm with appreciation. Please keep them in your room. I shall need them tomorrow for a special dinner. I had just arrived in Puri to send, spend my college summer vacation with my guru at his seaside hermitage. Built by Master and his disciples, the cheerful little two-storied retreat fronts on the Bay of Bengal. I awoke early the following morning, refreshed by the salty breezes and the quiet charm of the ashram. My guru's melodious voice was calling. I took a look at my cherished cauliflowers and stowed them neatly under my bed. Come, let us go to the beach. Master led the way. Several young disciples and I followed in a scattered group. Our guru surveyed us in mild criticism. When our western brothers walk, they usually take pride in unison. Now... Please march in two rows. Keep rhythmic step with one another. Sri Yukteswa watched as we obeyed. He began to sing. Boys go to and fro in a pretty little row. I could not but admire the ease with, with which Master was able to match the brisk pace of his young students. Halt, my guru's eyes sought mine. Did you remember to lock the back door of the hermitage? I think so, sir. Sri Yukteswa was silent for a moment, a half-suppressed smile on his lips. No, you forgot, he said firmly. Divine contemplation must not be made an excuse for material carelessness. You have neglected your duty in safeguarding the ashram. You must be punished. I thought he was obscurely joking when he added, 
Your six cauliflowers will soon only be five. We turned around at Master's orders and marched back until we were close to the hermitage. Rest a while, Mukunda. Look across the compound on our left. Observe the road beyond. A certain man will arrive there presently. He will be the means of your chastisement. I concealed my vexation at the incomprehensible remarks. A peasant soon appeared on the road. He was dancing grotesquely, flinging his arms about with meaningless gestures. Almost paralysed with curiosity, I glued my eyes on the hilarious spectacle. As the man reached a point in the road where he would vanish from our view, Sri Yukteswar said, Now he will return. The peasant at once changed his direction and made for the rear of the ashram. Crossing a sandy track, he entered the building by the back door. I had left it unlocked, even as my guru had said. The man emerged shortly, holding one of my prized cauliflowers. He now strode along respectably, respectably invested with the dignity of possession. The unfolding farce, in which my role appeared to be that of bewildered victim, was not so disconcerting that I failed an indignant pursuant of the thief. I was halfway to the road when Master called me back. He was shaking from head to foot with laughter. That poor crazy man has been longing for a cauliflower. Explained between her bursts of mouth. I thought it would be a good idea if he got one of yours so ill-guarded. I dashed to my room where I found that the thief, evidently one with a vegetable fixation, had left untouched my gold rings, watch and money, all lying openly on the blanket had crawled instead under the bed where the basket of cauliflowers completely hidden from casual sight had yielded the object of the single-hearted desire. Revered mother, I was baptised in infancy by your prophet husband. He was the guru of my parents and of my own guru, Sri Yukteswari. Will you therefore give me the privilege of hearing a few incidents in your sacred life? I was addressing Srimati Kashimoni, the live companion of Lahiri Mahasaya, finding myself in Benares for a short period, I was fulfilling a long-felt desire to visit the Venerable Lady. She received me graciously in the home of the Lahari family. Although aged, she was blooming like a lotus, emanating a spiritual fragrance. She was sort of she was medium built with fair skin, a slender neck and large lustrous eyes. Son, you are welcome here. Come upstairs.
Bruce H. Lipton, PhD Unleashing the power of consciousness, matter and miracles The science of how thoughts control life This new updated and expanded 10th anniversary edition of the biology of belief will forever change how you think about your own thinking. Stunning new scientific discoveries about the biochemical effects of the brain's functioning show that all the cells of your body are affected by your thoughts. Bruce H. Lipton, PhD, a renowned cell biologist, describes the precise molecular pathways through which this occurs. Using simple language, illustrations, humour and everyday examples, he determines how the new science of epigenetics is revolutionising our understanding of the link between mind and matter and the profound effects it has on our personal lives and the collective life of our species. This book is dedicated to Gaia, the mother of us all, Mother Earth. May she forgive our trespasses. If you could be anybody, who would you be? I used to spend an inordinate amount of time pondering that question. I was obsessed with the fantasy of changing my identity because I wanted to be anybody but me. I had a good career as a cell biologist and medical school professor, but that didn't make up for the fact that my personal life was at best a shambles. The harder I tried to find happiness and satisfaction in my personal life, the more dissatisfied and unhappy I became. In my reflective moments, I resolved to surrender to my unhappy life. I decided that fate had dealt me a bad hand and I should simply Accept it. Okay, Sarah. Sarah. In the fall of 1985, my, no, my depressed, fatalistic attitude changed in transformational moment. I had resigned from my tenured position at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and was teaching at an offshore medical college in the Caribbean. Because the school was so far from the academic mainstream, I had the opportunity to think outside the rigid parameters of belief that prevail in conventional academia. Far from the ivory towers, isolated on an emerald island in the deep azure Caribbean Sea. I experienced a scientific epiphany that shattered my beliefs about the nature of life. My life-changing moment occurred when I was 
was reviewing my research on the mechanisms by which cells control their physiology and behaviour. Suddenly, I realised that a cell's life is fundamentally controlled by the physical and energetic environment with only a small contribution by its genes. Genes are simply molecular blueprints used in the construction of cells, tissues and organs. The environment serves as a contractor who reads and engages those genetic blueprints as is ultimately responsible for the character of the cell's life. It is a single cell's awareness of the environment that primarily sets into motion the mechanisms of its life. A cell biologist I knew, as a cell biologist I knew that my insights had powerful ramifications for my life and the lives of all human beings. I was acutely aware that each of us had each of us is made up of approximately fifty trillion single cells. I had devoted my professional life to better understanding single cells because I knew then and know now that the better we understand single cells, the better we can understand the community of cells that compromises that comprises each human body and that if single cells are controlled by their awareness of the environment so too are we trillion celled human beings just like a single cell the character of our lives is determined not by our genes but by our responses to the environmental signals that propel life. Sound Healing with Tuning Forks by John Barlio. sustained by a submerged sound. Further imagine that everything we do and think, whether good or bad, moral or immoral, is an attempt to seek out and merge with that sound. Our goal is to return to the source of the fountain. Although we may identify with the object of value, 
i.e. a man or woman, a car, etc. The real attraction is the resonance we experience when in the presence of that person or that thing. The experience vibrates us like a tuning fork and becomes a sonic homing boy confirming our inner journey. Further imagine that you are a being of sound. Composed of many tones, your shape, movements, desires and motivations come from an inner concert. Everything you know and feel is sound. Your concert is everywhere. When you dance, your body organs will make sounds and your muscles will play the correct tones. Your voice sing praises and the stars. discovered human tuning. I discovered that tuning forks could be used to tune the human nervous system in 1974. I was working at the Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital in New York City under a research grant from the New York University. A psychologist colleague of mine who knew of my interest in sound, told me about an anechoic chamber located at New York University's psychology laboratory. An anechoic chamber is a scientifically engineered room of complete silence and darkness. I immediately arranged to visit the laboratory in order to experience the anechoic I learned about anechoic chambers in John Cage's book, Silence. John Cage was a new music composer, philosopher and author who went on to search for total silence. In his book, Silence, he tells of his experiences in an anechoic chamber at Harvard University. Sitting in total silence and darkness, he heard a high and low-pitched sound. Upon leaving the anechoic chamber, the engineer told him the high-pitched sound was his nervous system in operation. The low-pitched sound was his blood in circulation. the magic open up a new world for you and bring you joy for your entire existence. This is my intention for you and for the whole world.
duty is more urgent than that of returning thanks. Ancient spiritual teachings say that what we give to another person with a heart, with a full heart, returns to us a hundredfold. So being grateful and saying thank you to another person for anything you receive from them is not only urgent, it is vital to improving your life. Gratitude is a powerful energy and so whomever you direct gratitude's energy towards, that's where it goes. If you think of gratitude's energy looking like a sparkling magic dust, then when you express gratitude to another person in return for something you received from them, you are literally sprinkling them with that magic dust. The powerful positive energy in magic dust reaches and affects whomever you sprinkle it on. Magic practice number 14. Have a magical day. One, count your blessings. Make a list of ten blessings. Write why you're grateful. Reread your list. And at the end of each blessing, say thank you. And feel as grateful for that blessing as you can. In the morning, walk your way in your mind through the plans you have for that day in the evening until bedtime. With each plan or event, say the magic words. Thank you. For it having Imagine that you're saying thank you at the end of the day and you're immensely grateful because it went perfectly. After you've finished being grateful for all the plans in your day going brilliantly well, end this magical practice by saying and thank you for the great news coming. Just before you go to sleep, hold your magic rock in one hand and say the magic words. Thank you for the best thing that happened during the day. The magic. Is for raising conscious, confident, and caring kids by Susan Stifelman, MFT, author of Parenting Without Power Struggles. Clear, wise, soulful, and poetic.
Now it's your turn. Sit quietly and reflect on the following questions, recording your thoughts in your journal. When you were a child, what did you love to do? Did you enjoy playing outdoors, painting, making music, writing poetry, building things, spending time with friends, solving puzzles, reading? What do you love to do now? Or what would you do simply for pleasure if you had the time and freedom to pursue your passions? In the past three months, how often have you engaged in an activity related to one of your passions? If your answer is not at all, how long has it been since you spent time on something? for pure pleasure. What gets in the way of pursuing your hobbies, interests or passions? How might your children benefit if you were to pursue one of your passions or interests? Listening respectfully. We can coach our children to express their wishes without aggression and to listen respectfully to us others. But as I have said again and again, we have to show them what that looks like for it to stick. Telling your child not to interrupt or roll her eyes will mean nothing if you and your partner interrupt and roll your eyes at each other when you don't see eye to eye. I once read that before you speak, you should ask yourself three things. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? The greatest way to live with honour in this world is to be what we pretend to be. Socrates. I once read about a tribe in Africa whose members do something quite extraordinary when somebody does something wrong. They believe that every person comes into the world wanting love and peace, but that sometimes people make mistakes. For two days the whole tribe surrounds the wrongdoer, telling him everything good he has done in his life. They view the man's trans trans transgression as a cry for help and come together to hold him up and remind him of who he is, until he remembers the core goodness from which he temporarily became disconnected. Consider what might happen if we did that with our kids who were troubled or hurting. Imagine compassionately reminding them of their goodness instead of berating them when they made a mistake. When we know that we are loved, even after we have lost our way, it is far easier for us to acknowledge our wrongdoing and look for ways to make amends. Restoring the trust of those we care about. shows parents how they can transform parenting into a spiritual practice. Eckhart Tolle, author of The Power of Now. 
Our children can be our greatest teachers.